is my pleasure to welcome Melissa Ireland, Laurier's Director, Indigenous Initiatives. Hi, everyone. Hi there. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the land that I'm on. I'm currently living and working in Waterloo. That's on the Haldeman Tract and the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Neutral Peoples. And I also welcome you to think about the land that you're on, wherever you're at, and acknowledge the land where you sit. All right, so just a little bit about myself. My name is Melissa Ireland. I am the director of Laurier's Indigenous Initiatives, and I've worked at Laurier for about, I'm going to date myself, but over 15 years. And I've been doing Indigenous student support since um, 2010. I've been really lucky that I get to witness the growth of Laurier's Indigenous initiatives over the past decade. And we're working really hard during the pandemic to support the over 544 Indigenous students at Laurier multi-campus. Um, and uh, I have a staff team that is dedicated to um, supporting Indigenous students, as well as doing Indigenous inclusion work across Laurier's multi-campuses. So um, just, that's just a little bit about myself and what I do. It's hard to share that in a nutshell, but I am knowing that you're not here to um, necessarily talk about me. Uh, one other thing I will add is that I'm also a Laurier alumni. So I graduated in um, 2017. I did my MSW at Laurier uh, part-time while working full-time. So I'm a proud Golden Hawk as well. So um, I'd love to talk a little bit about um, how I know Alan. Alan um, was one of the first students that I worked with in 2010. Um, he had, I, I believe he was uh, finishing up his master's and transitioning into his PhD work. And I got to tell you, I have so many wonderful memories of Alan in those early days. I will say that he helped us plan and organize our first really big event for the community. So we worked together on Laurier's uh, lacrosse tournament. It was a friendship tournament, uh, inviting Six Nations youth to play lacrosse on our campuses. So that was a really successful event that we worked with with Alan for a couple of years. As well, I remember, um, this is before we had the Indigenous Student Center in Waterloo. Alan and I uh, sat down with a lot of undergrad students once a week in the basement of 202 Regina, and we would sit for an afternoon, uh, have pizza for the students, um, learn about what their homework was. So <laughs> Alan was supporting some students on their, their papers even, and just getting together and gathering community. So that was, I think, the fall of 2010 is when uh, we worked together at what we called a lounge time before we had our Indigenous Student Center. So those are just a few pieces um, that I've got to witness Alan in action, but I've really witnessed him grow into an amazing professor and scholar, um, and we got to hear about his work today. So I would like to officially welcome Dr. Alan Downey to our event today. Hi everyone, and um, thank you so much, Melissa, for the introduction. Um, as as mentioned, my name is Alan Downey. I'm the Keth and of the Lasulu clan. Um, I'm also an associate professor in the Department of History and Indigenous Studies program at McMaster University. And uh, I just want to break down what I had introduced you to. So um, I'm the Keth, which means the people that travel upon the water. Um, it's a, a, my nation, which is in central British Columbia. And my community is Nakazali Wuwetan, which means the uh, place where the arrows of the dwarves flowed through. Uh, and that's my actual community. So it's about two and a half hours northwest of Prince George, British Columbia. Lusulu clan means frog clan. Uh, we're matrilineal, so I actually trace that through my mother, my grandmother, great grandmother, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way back. Um, and it's, it's great to be here. I can't thank Melissa, Brittany, Lisa, and the Alumni Association enough for having me. Um, what I would love to do is actually just share some inside stories with you about writing the book, uh, writing this thing, which basically took 10 years. Um, 
from when I started it as a MA student in 2007 at Laurier. Uh, I was working in the Department of History at the time. I did a small little 40 page paper or well, what I consider small now, I guess, a 40 page paper on the history of lacrosse in Six Nations. And then I turned that into a PhD dissertation, which I did at Laurier up until 2014 when I finally finished. The book was published in early 2018, uh, in January 2018. So it's gone from a MA uh, major research paper to a PhD dissertation into finally uh, a book. So today, what I wanna do is just share some inside stories quickly uh, for about the next 15 minutes, the research process and what really I found surprising. What were some of the surprising stories that I came across while writing this history of lacrosse? So as I do that, I'm actually gonna share a screen with you and share um, this slideshow. So why lacrosse? Why pick lacrosse? It's a niche game, uh, I'll admit that. Um, so what is it about lacrosse that makes it interesting for a research topic? And really um, what it came down to is what I had found is historically lacrosse has been this critical piece of indigenous nationhood and the articulation of their self-determination. Um, how did I know this and how did I come across this? Well, I was a lacrosse player. You can actually see my jersey in the background here from my collegiate days. I did my undergrad in the States. Um, I'm actually, I was born and raised, I should mention this, I was born and raised in Waterloo. Um, so I'm from Waterloo. Uh, lived my entire life there. I've been traveling back to my community since I was about 10 years old. I go now, I go biannually at least. Um, but with COVID, that's kind of stopped things. But usually I'm there at least twice a year doing work with the community. Um, but I was born and raised in Waterloo. I actually just lived near Conestoga Mall. Um, and my family still lives there to this very day. Uh, I'm located in Hamilton now. But why I decided to pick lacrosse was because I was a lacrosse player. And I started playing lacrosse when I was 10 years old. And within that, it's, it's well known within the lacrosse community that lacrosse is an indigenous game. It's just generally known within, um, within the lacrosse circle that it's an indigenous game and it always has been. So I remember growing up hearing stories of great indigenous athletes um, always going to Six Nations to play games um, and always kind of hearing this kind of proverbial discourse or this constant uh, chatter about, oh, this is a, an, an indigenous game or it was an indigenous game. And that kind of sparked my interest. I had an interest in history and an interest in the sport of lacrosse. So I was an athlete and I had this interest as a history student, especially in my undergrad, uh, about researching the history of this game. And so then uh, after I did my undergrad, I decided to come back to Laurier to do my master's. And that's when I was really able to kind of combine my two interests. Um, and that is look at the history of this game, the history of lacrosse and what it can tell us about indigenous, non-indigenous relations, uh, indigenous sovereignty and nationhood. So nationhood just simply meaning that indigenous peoples know and understand that they belong to nations. Um, some people in the old days would call it tribes, um, but we like to say nation or nationhood. Um, and so how did lacrosse play an active role in that was the question I was interested in answering. Well, from the very beginning, I was interested in uh, creating and producing something I call a resurgent history. This is based on a theory by Leanne Simpson and a few others, but Leanne Simpson is kind of the main person that's really taken this um, to task. And what it means is resurgence just simply means that she makes the argument, Leanne Simpson does, that we need to, as indigenous peoples, yes, it's important that we focus on the colonial outside, the indigenous outside, that we focus on things like residential schools and horrific colonial policies. We need, to, we need to research those things and that's important. We need to stop those from happening um, or the out adoption of indigenous children to non-indigenous parents, uh, which is called the 60s scoop. Um, but at the same time, we need to make sure as indigenous peoples that we're looking inward, that 
we as indigenous folk are looking inward to kind of build the fires of the indigenous inside that the ceremonies, the language, the culture, that resurgence needs to take place within our communities where we focus on the indigenous inside. And I thought, okay, well, what better way of doing that than using history for me, at least, I thought it might be a good way to kind of help indigenous communities, the communities that I was working with to produce a resurgent history, a piece of history that tells their story from the inside that can help um, kind of this resurgence of indigenous history itself um, through various stories. And so a big part of this resurgent history was that I wanted to become an apprentice. Um, and that's what ended up occurring um, with the communities that I worked with. So I worked with Six Nations of the Grand River, um, some people in Aquasasne, which is just outside of Cornwall, Ontario, Ganawage, just outside of Montreal, Ganasatage, which most people know as Oka. And in connecting with various knowledge holders and elders and them sharing their brilliance, I actually became kind of the apprentice. I was fortunate enough to have the kind of time, room, and space to be able to collect this brilliance that they were willing to share with me and to put it in a, a record into a book form. Um, and so that was important to me. Also, um, what is key, and this is where Melissa and the Indigenous Student Center, and at the time, Jean Becker were so important in my development, was not only to give me the confidence to even begin to asking these type of questions, but also thinking about how can I um, be ethical and responsible to the communities that I'm working with. And one of the ways that I was doing that or attempting to do that, thanks to all that work that Melissa had put in and, and everybody at the Indigenous Student Center, it used to be called the Aboriginal Student Center, the Indigenous Student Center um, was to think about being accountable and thinking about accountability and reciprocity. So how, as I, as a researcher, even though I'm Indigenous, how am I going to make sure that I'm accountable to the communities that I'm working with? Well, a lot of those ways of being accountable was to make sure that it was open as possible with all of the research. So I spent the last decade working with those communities and community organizations like Six Nations Polytechnic, uh, the Ganawage Culture Center, um, the Ganasatage Culture Center, working with elders to share um, what I was doing, the research that I was conducting, and what was going to happen to that research. And that brings me to kind of into this, to the second point of ethical research within Indigenous communities, at least what I was attempting to do with this book, was to um, make sure that I put reciprocity at the fore, the forefront of everything that I was doing. And so one of the ways that I was doing that was I was a I was a very long time ago, uh, a semi-skilled lacrosse player, let's say. Um, I don't know that I was any good, but um, I, I did have a skill set where I wanted to share that with Indigenous youth. And so what I would do is uh, all these stories that I collected in the book, um, all those chapters, I actually broke down into youth presentations that I would present at culture centers, and um, lacrosse camps and um, in high schools in indigenous community settings, trying to share the information and the research that I was working with and being able to collect with indigenous youth. And I've actually spent, uh, I like to kid with my, my, my class or my students um, that th you know, this is my nine to five job generally is as a professor, but my job after that um, has always been, and my passion has always been devoted towards working with Indigenous youth and sharing these stories, because that's part of this resurgent pro project that I wanted to do, is to take these stories and actually give them back to the Indigenous youth that, uh, the communities that I was actually working with. And so there were some kind of shocking uh, really interesting stories to me. And I want to take you through a few of those now. Um, one of the really interesting things that I found right at the beginning is in this map that I was able to create. So where did it all begin? Well, it, from the Haudenosaunee perspective, it was a gift from the creator. 
one of the interesting things that I found almost immediately was that I could trace lacrosse all across North America um, prior to contact from various indigenous oral histories, um, from lacrosse stick evidence at museums, as well as um, post-contact narratives by missionaries and things like that. And I was able to very quickly uh, recognize and realize and identify that lacrosse had actually existed across North America. It was one of the most widespread sports played prior to contact. So the Nova, uh, among the Mi'kmaq in Nova Scotia, down to the Seminole Nation in Florida, West California, or what is present day California in the Pomo Nation, up to um, into British Columbia and all in between, indigenous communities had various versions of the game of lacrosse. Now, here's a couple of examples on the right of your screen of lacrosse sticks. So some nations like the Anishinaabe had one small stick Others like the Choctaw might have had two sticks. So the Choctaw, if you don't know, are in the southeast of the United States. Uh, and then you have a Cayuga stick, which is a Haudenosaunee stick, which is one large pocketed stick. Well, how is it that the game of lacrosse, this gift from the creator, and you can get you can check out that story in the creator's game. How is it that it became such a critical and a piece of or excuse me, of non-Indigenous nations or of Canada specifically, how did it become uh, Canada's national sport? And what I ended up finding was that there was this individual by the name of George W. Beers, who plays an instrumental role in what I call the colonization of the game. In the 1840s, Indigenous athletes introduced non-Indigenous athletes to the game of lacrosse in the city of Montreal. And these non-Indigenous um, kind of advocates for the sport end up creating the first non-Indigenous lacrosse club in 1856, known as the Montreal Lacrosse Club. And that's headed by George W. Beers. Well, Beers is this kind of stark nationalist. But at this time that lacrosse is becoming popular in Canada among non-Indigenous audiences, they don't really know, that is Canadians, don't really know what it means to be Canadian. They don't know how to differentiate themselves from the US or Great Britain, uh, or specifically like Ireland or England or Scotland or France. Um, that is still being worked through at the time of up until Confederation, so 1850s to the 1860s. Well, one of the ways that they feel that they can create a national identity is actually to appropriate this indigenous game. Um, and Beers kind of leads this up. And the reason why they do that is because indigenous peoples, quote unquote, Indians at the time, are of this territory. So non-indigenous peoples are now attempting by the 1860s to claim Canada as their own. They're trying to claim territories that they are foreign to, whether they were here from one generation or five generations, it doesn't matter. Uh, they're claiming territory that's not their own. And one of the ways that they're trying to establish a unique Canadian identity is by claiming things of that territory. Well, of that territory includes quote unquote Indians and their game, lacrosse. And so what they start doing is claiming this game as their national sport, because in order to um, have some validity towards their uh, national identity, it had to be from the place of the territory. And that was the game of lacrosse, because it's from these lands. And that's a big reason why they ended up appropriating it. Okay, so the question becomes, why do we care about this? Well, What's interesting that I never knew before I started this research was in 1889, residential school administrators start introducing the game of lacrosse into residential schools to assimilate Indigenous youth. So within the span of about 30 years, think of this for a second, within 30 years, what you end up seeing happen is the game of lacrosse is introduced to non-Indigenous athletes in Montreal. By 1856, there's a non-Indigenous lacrosse organization formed. In 1860, non-Indigenous uh, athletes, especially Beers, writes a uniform code of rules that um, kind of molds the sport towards their perceptions of what the game of lacrosse should be. That is, 
the opposite of what they thought should be the opposite of indigeneity, that it should be British and civilized and Anglophone and Protestant and all of those things. Well, this idea that Beers is selling that the game of lacrosse is a national is the national game of Canada. He sells it so successfully that by 1889, residential school administrators think of it as not an indigenous game, but as a non-indigenous game, as a Canadian game. That it became so um, civil, quote unquote, civilized, and um, such a great demonstra demonstration of white civility that they started assimilating indigenous youth through the game of lacrosse in 1889. And we see from Ontario west to British Columbia, with the exception of Alberta, that they're using the game in residential schools to assimilate indigenous youth. And yet that's not the end of the story because there's these really cool moments uh, where Indigenous peoples speak back and actually take back that game. One of the cases in, of, and examples of this is this person in the bottom right, whose name is Andy Paul. And Andy Paul goes to the residential school in Squamish, British Columbia, which is, um, it's now North Shore, uh, Vancouver. And he's introduced to the game of lacrosse. Well, what he ends up as an Indigenous youth in a residential school what he does is he connects to it, not as a kind of Canadian sport, as was the intention, but rather he connects to it as being an Indigenous youth, knowing that this was an Indigenous game. So he starts to say to himself, oh, as a good Indigenous person, I take pride, um, very much like I did when I was an Indigenous youth growing up in Waterloo, I took pride in playing this Indigenous game. And so he connects to that. And by the 1930s, he ends up forming all Indigenous lacrosse teams to compete in um, Canadian indoor championship lacrosse, which is really cool. Um, and he takes these all Indigenous teams to compete. So he would kind of create one of these first national, really significant, important all Indigenous teams. And that would be followed by the Iroquois Nationals, who in 1990 actually returned to international competition. Now I say they returned to international competition because actually what ends up happening is in 1860, George Beers writes a uniform code of rules. In 1867, he updates that rules and he introduces a form of segregation. What he says is that indigenous players can play for or cannot play for a non-indigenous team unless previously agreed upon. But they could play for Canadian championship um, competitions. Now, that happens in 1867. He introduces segregation, basically saying no Indigenous player can play for a non-Indigenous team. But if they're separate and equal, they can play. And so this is known as segregation. Lacrosse, er, Canada has a very, very, very long history of segregation against Black and Indigenous and people of color um, athletes and individuals elsewhere, movie theaters, things like that. Um, this, we know that this, these things have happened. Well, this is one form of segregation in sport. Well, in 1880, what ends up happening is the Canadian National Lacrosse Association reformulates itself and ends up banning Indigenous players altogether um, in 1880. And so within a span of a few years, you have Indigenous athletes introducing the game, non-Indigenous athletes appropriating that game, then banning Indigenous peoples and claiming it as a source of their national identity. So in 1990 and in the early uh, 1980s, what the Iroquois Nationals attempt to do is actually uh, right this historical injustice. And the way that they do that is the Haudenosaunee, so there's six nations within the Haudenosaunee, um, they decide that they want to create an international lacrosse team to represent themselves as a sovereign nation in international competition. Now, there's a very long story to this um, in the 1980s and what ends up happening, all covered in the book, but they're actually meet with success in 1990. And they become the only Indigenous team in the world in any sport to actually represent themselves as a sovereign nation in international competition. 
There's one exception to this. There's the Maori All Blacks, which is a rugby team, but they actually can't compete uh, in the world, uh, the world kind of championship, the World Cup of rugby, um, because those Maori players actually have to play for New Zealand if they want to represent um, their international body, which is New Zealand. Um, so the Iroquois Nationals to this day are actually one of the only indigenous, the only indigenous team that represents itself in international competition as a sovereign nation. To this day, they travel on the Haudenosaunee passport. Um, they will not accept funding from the Canadian or U.S. government. Um, and they actually created, the lacrosse team is, that is, actually created the Haudenosaunee national flag um, in the early 1990s, which is in the bottom right-hand corner for you there. That flag, that symbol has become taken uh, for granted a little bit um, by not just the Haudenosaunee, but by all Indigenous peoples as this great symbol of Indigenous sovereignty and specifically Haudenosaunee sovereignty. And yet most people don't know that it was the lacrosse team that actually uh, helped create that flag. It's based on a wampum belt um, out of Haudenosaunee history, of course, but the flag itself uh, was created so that they could hoist it at the World Lacrosse Championships. So with that, I don't want to talk too much more because I know a lot of people might have some questions. I know Melissa has some. So I'll turn it over to Melissa, uh, who I know has a, a few questions that, uh, that she's prepared for tonight. Okay, first, Alan, thank you so much, um, not only for your words, but for writing this book, um, for role modeling the journeys of the people who are coming before for you and after you. And um, I just really appreciate uh, your words and your generosity of yourself. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. I always learn. <laughs> um, so I guess the first question I'm gonna ask, um, and for those of you who have read the book, there's a mention and a connection to the Indigenous Student Center. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about your connection to the Indigenous Student Center at Laurier and your journey as a student? Yeah, the, the Indigenous Student Center at Laurier played such a key role in, in not just in this book. This book wouldn't be possible without the Indigenous Student Center. And a lot of that was because here I was, I, come, I came home from the U.S. after four years, starting a, a master's, and it was, um, I was having kind of um, a real moment of an existential crisis, really, of who was I as an Indigenous person, and what, what was my future going to hold? Um, because I wanted, I wanted to do something in our communities. I wanted to be able to contribute in some small way. And how was I going to do that? But at the same time, I didn't have the confidence to do that. Um, and I think when I got connected in two, about 2010, a little bit earlier, um, just through the various people that were at, the various Indigenous people that were at Laurier, um, it was when I got connected with the Indigenous Student Center um, and the Aboriginal Student Association at the time that it really kind of helped me gain confidence in being not only proud of who I was, but um, confident in the process of that I, I, might, I might actually have a role to play, hopefully. Um, and I don't know that I've ever succeeded in doing this, but I'm, I'm trying, but a role to play within community, um, whether it's ur urban indigenous people or on reserve, my own community. Um, it, it just played such a, an important and significant role in my development um, in my confidence as an Indigenous person, as an urban Indigenous person, um, to work through with other Indigenous students, um, research, and what it meant to be a scholar, what it meant to be a, an Indigenous student on Waterloo's campus. Um, and so that all played such a, a really important and significant role. I remember having, um, there were so many times where I wanted to quit. My MA, I wanted to quit. My PhD, I wanted to quit a hundred times. And it was conversations that I had at the Indigenous Student Center and at, 
um, eventually when they got the house at on Albert Street, um, sitting there, and I, I'm not sure that everybody realized just how important it was to me or what it meant to me, but um, to be able to sit there and to share my experiences and to know that Melissa had gone through similar experiences and Jean Becker had gone through uh, other experiences and Candace Baptiste had gone through uh, experiences that I was feeling and going through. It just, um, it just really gave me the confidence just to continue and to want to continue. Uh, I really appreciate that. It's meant a lot to me. Well, thank you for your continued connection and we miss seeing you on the daily, but we are so proud of you. So I just wanted to share that. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, this book is written with a blend of storytelling and research. Um, can you talk to us about storytelling and its role in this book? Yeah, so if you, you'll notice um, if you've read the book or when you read the book that uh, a big part of it, uh, my research process was actually my own storytelling with my own tricksters. This is, this came out of, um, I didn't know what to do. There's all these anomalies in the case uh, of lacrosse where here you have this really important, significant, critical element of Indigenous communities. That is lacrosse. Uh, it's connected to Indigenous ceremonies, Indigenous social political relations. It's not compartmentalized like uh, sport is in non-Indigenous communities. In fact, it's, it embraces those things. It embraces social political relations. It embraces things like the Haudenosaunee passport. Um, and it, it's key, those things aren't separated. But I didn't know how to tell that story. I didn't know how to tell that story in traditional format. And by reading people like Leanne Simpson um, and so, so many others, um, indigenous storytellers, what I found was that here, there was, this, there was already this model for incredible scholars and academics and activists and knowledge holders that were sharing indigenous history through storytelling. And so in order to counter kind of all these contradictions, the trickster um, that I use named Uzdaz, uh, who's my trickster in Decathlon storytelling, um, was kind of the perfect um, device, let's call them, um, to use in story uh, as a way of storytelling to be able to tell this history that how is it that non-Indigenous people are introduced to this game, then take it, create a national identity out of it, then try to assimilate Indigenous youth, and yet there's all these amazing Indigenous people that actually counter that um, and counter those residential school policies the best that they can by gravitating towards this Indigenous sport. How do you tell that story? And it, I use the device of a storyteller, storytelling, and the device of uh, Uzdaz to, to say that, hey, this is not unknown to us in Indigenous communities, particularly my Indigenous community, uh, uh, being Deketh, is that we have tricksters that play these roles all the time. So for instance, I'll give you a quick story. Uzdaz, um, before in Deketh Keo, which is known as Central British Columbia, Deketh and Keo, Keo's land, Deketh being the people that travel upon water, in Deketh Keo, Central British Columbia, um, a long time ago, very, very, very long ago, there was no water, there was no sunlight. And it's actually Uzdas who tricks uh, his grandfather, it turns out to be. Um, and he does, he's generally, I don't use a gender pronoun for Uzdas. I usually say they, but in this story specifically, it's a he, because um, he's a little boy at the time. And Uzdas actually tricks his grandfather, steals all of the water in Deketh Keo, which is held in a basket or like a little bowl. And he runs with it. And as he's running with it, his grandfather is chasing him uh, or others are chasing him to get it back. And he actually spills all of, he spills some of that water and creates all the lakes and rivers in Deketh Keo. So he tricks his grandfather, steals something, but then produces something for indigenous peoples to benefit from. Well, that happens a lot. Those types of tricks happen a lot throughout this history of lacrosse. And so I try to use Uzdaz and the storytelling aspect to get that across. Um, that really challenges the way in which um, I would say kind of Western colonial history has been produced. 
Um, and I, I don't know how successful it is. I, people seem to love it. Historians, not so much. It's, um, they, they, they've challenged me on it. Um, but when it comes to the communities and to individuals like my own community um, or in indigenous communities, they've really gravitated towards it. They generally love it. Um, you know, any feedback I've got, they really seem to enjoy that storytelling aspect. Um, which puts me in a little bit of a bind because I'm an academic um, that is being criticized and judged by my career by historians, but I never really wrote that book. Um, I, I never really wrote it for academics. Um, it has academic language, sure, of course, but really the people that I cared most about were those that I was working with and being mentored by in the community organizations that helped me produce that. So if it worked and indigenous youth could gravitate towards it, could relate to it, then that's that's what meant the most to me throughout writing this thing. Well, if I recall, you did win a historical award for this book as well, though. Yeah. So not all historians hated it. <laughs> true enough, true enough. <laughs> I have a couple of friends on my side, I guess, I, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> um, can, can you re remind me what that award is called? Yeah, so uh, I was fortunate to win a couple of awards for it, um, but the big one was the Canada Prize uh, by the Humanities um, and Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, so basically, it's the um, it was awarded the basically the best academic book in the country um, in 2019. Which I, I just I, I I never I never expected anyone to read this thing. The fact that there's 60 people in this room or more. Um, I, I, ne I never ever thought anyone would read it. I thought this thing was going to die on a shelf um, as just a PhD dissertation among the many millions that are, or thousands, hundreds of thousands that are written. Um, I, I, it's just, yeah, I don't really, it's still, it's a couple of years later, it still hasn't really sunk in that people are reading it. Well, I think that's one of my favorite parts about the book. And I do want to let the lacrosse listeners know that a lacrosse question is coming up. I have one more non-lacrosse related question, and then we'll get into that. But um, I wanted you to share a little bit about your work with elders in this book. Yeah, that's uh, that was such an amazing part of this. And I had I already kind of mentioned this a little bit. Um, there's so, so much incredible, um, just amazing brilliance within Indigenous communities. And I was so lucky to work with a handful of knowledge holders and community activists and elders for this book. They are front and center. If you read it, um, you'll see that their words are front and center throughout. And that was really important to me that um, it's their brilliance that I was just had that time and space to be able to collect and put into a book format. Um, sure, I have some of my own analyses throughout the book, but it's their brilliance that really connects all of it and makes it work um, for people to want to enjoy it. So Delmore Jacobs and Rick Hill, uh, Karen Etchen, so many people, John Cree. Um, so uh, that I have named a couple people from Six Nations of the Grand River, a couple people from uh, Gunasatage and uh, Ganawage. They, they just played such an important role because um, they were really, they were mentoring me. I, I wasn't going in, at first I was making the mistake probably of asking questions rather than listening. And then I started recognizing or that that wasn't, that wasn't my job in this part. Um, rather, it was to be a tremendous. I just had to be a good listener, I think, because there's just, again, that brilliance of those elders that were able to and to work with me and mentor me um, throughout this process. I leaned on them a lot. So, um, for instance, I don't, I try not to at times, uh, unless it's absolutely necessary, I don't talk about the longhouse portion of lacrosse games. There's a very specific reason for that. Um, number one, I'm non Haudenosaunee. I'm non, number two, I'm non longhouse. It's really important for me to recognize my own positionality that that's not my place. It's not my place to be talking about um, longhouse ceremonies. 
unless it was absolutely necessary, where I could lean on the elders to help me through that process, that they would be able to edit and kind of curate what would be told and what would not be told. Um, Audra Simpson actually calls this uh, like a, a kind of a refusal. And so Audra Simpson, very famous um, Ginyagahaga or Mohawk scholar at Columbia University, um, calls this type of research a refusal, refusal of, um, I basically will only tell you what you need to know rather than at times what you might want to know. And sometimes when it came to the longhouse and longhouse ceremonies, there's a lot that did not get included, but that's because, um, you know, I, of the position I was in, but the mentoring that I got from all those brilliant, brilliant elders um, who I remain friends with to this day and um, often go see. COVID has really put a damper in this, but um, I still go and have coffee and breakfast with Rick Hill and Six Nations quite a bit. Um, I talk to John Cree once in a while and Karen Etchen and we're on Facebook. So it's been, it's been so much fun. And I, uh, every time I go out to BC, I get to see Dave and Andrea Jacobs, who if you read chapter three, they're such an important part of that chapter. Um, I wouldn't have been able to do it without them. So um, that, that, that is really important to me. The other thing I will say um, is if you bought the book, thank you so much for buying it. Not because I, I care to sell more books or anything like that, but um, everything's donated to my community for this book. Um, so if you look at the very front, I think it's the second page, third page or something, um, with all the credits, it's actually all the money um, that's raised by selling copies of this book actually go to the Nikosley Wet and Youth Center. Um, so over the last couple of years, it's been, a, it's been a pretty cool experience to be able to go out west to my community um, to, to donate the proceeds of the book for people that I never thought would read it, ended up reading it. Um, it's been, it's been an amazing journey. And I, to this day, even though the book is done, I continue to, um, I continue to give presentations at local high schools in, in and around Six Nations and Ganawage. Uh, continue. And I will always do that because that accountability and reciprocity doesn't end when the research is over, the book is done. Um, in fact, if anything, it just ramps up afterwards, um, where I will continue to do that because it's my responsibility to do that. I, I feel uh, strongly feel that um, until people stop asking. And so as long as they ask, I, I will continue to go. So. You really are that kind and generous, Alan. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that's beautiful to know that about the Youth Center. And uh, I know that so many are in attendance because they have a huge love of lacrosse and they're very keen to learn more from the history uh, and about the history. And I know you've alluded that, um, you know, there's things that you learn that you can share and you can't share, but could you talk a little bit more about um, the Haudenosaunee conception of lacrosse and worldview that you can share publicly? Yeah, um, one of the things that I can share because it's been shared openly and freely is the creation story, which is so amazing. It's the, the um, in the preface to the book where it's Delmore Jacobs' brilliance there, uh, who's a Keig faith keeper from Six Nations of the Grand River, shared with me in 2011 the creation story that um, here this game for the Haudenosaunee, this is Haudenosaunee specific. So the Anishinaabe creation story is different than the Haudenosaunee story. The Mi'kma story of lacrosse and the creation story of lacrosse is different from the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe. Each nation has their own creation story about where this game came from. But for the Haudenosaunee, their game came from uh, the sky world. Now, in the Haudenosaunee creation story, there's a woman that ends up falling through a hole in the sky. Um, and she falls towards a world of water where the geese, sometimes it's birds, it depends on who's telling the story. They look up, they see this woman falling from the sky. And there's lots of other parts to the story I'm skipping over and not doing it justice. So please read it. Um, it's, it's very easy to find, but it's also in the preface of the book. Um, you can get it from your local library, so you don't even have to buy the book. Um, you can get it from your library. Just request it, and they'll, they'll get it for you. Um, but in that story, a woman, a pregnant woman, falls from the sky. They know her as Sky Woman, yes, and ends up, there's a picture of it, ends up on the back of a turtle. 
this pregnant sky woman, she actually has a child and it's a female child. And she ends up creating North America, excuse me, I'm skipping over too much. Uh, she ends up creating North America and she has a child and it's a female child. Her child grows up, lots of other parts to that story and ends up getting pregnant uh, by the West Wind. Now, when she's pregnant, she's actually pregnant with twins. They're told that these two twins fought within the womb of this, uh, this woman and their mother. And when it came time for them to be born, the first twin that was born was our creator, the Haudenosaunee's creator. And the second twin that was born was his brother. And his brother was impatient and actually came out. Uh, the creator was created in the, uh, born in the normal way that a baby is born, but his brother was impatient. And so his brother actually comes out of his mother's armpit and kills his mother. She eventually um, becomes Mother Earth. And there's lots of other parts to that story. It's, it's, it could go on for days. Um, but what they end up doing is as these two brothers grow up in North America or Turtle Island, they create things in the world and the creator creates kind of all the good minded things and his brother creates the opposite of things. So it comes down to a dispute and they're taught by their grandmother who fell from sky woman who fell from the sky. She has all this brilliance that she had learned from the sky world. And she teaches them that to, in order to solve conflicts, you can do it through games. One of the game, first games they end up playing is called the Peach Bowl game, still played in the Longhouse to this day. Um, and what it is, it's a bowl and it has peach pits or pits um, that are dark on one side, light on the other side, and they try to flip them all one color in this bowl. It's a betting game. It goes back and forth, back and forth. Well, they play this for six days, and because they're equally powerful, they can't beat each other. So the second game they play is the stick and ball game of lacrosse. And so this, again, I'm skipping over a lot and rushing through it, and I don't mean to do injustice to the story. There's so much brilliance involved in this. Um, please read Delmore's story uh, in the preface to get uh, a, a more detailed account of it. But this is where the game of lacrosse comes from. And that's why it's called, the book is called The Creator's Game. It's because it's creator that actually gifts this game to people on Turtle Island. Um, and actually it's animals that play the first game before human beings even ever see it, um, which is a really cool part of the story. There's many of those uh, involved. They're all included in the book uh, in some of those storytelling um, introductions. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to um, ask some questions from the audience now through the chat box. So um, I, I just wanted to let you know that um, we have a question from Bill Morrison, and he's asking, uh, where does this topic slash game fit into reconciling? Good. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of ways. Um, one is to recognize, first and foremost, that this long history of horrific colonial policies, whether it's appropriating an Indigenous game, banning Indigenous players, segregating the game, the modern day lacrosse organizations have benefited from this occurring. Um, and so it's really important that I think if we're in the age of so-called reconciliation, um, I often, I don't teach about reconciliation. I don't include it in my lectures. Um, because I think we have a long way to go before we're able to reconcile anything. And usually the reconciliation involves, rec if we talk about reconciliation without talking about the restitution of land, you don't have reconciliation. Um, but one of the things that we have to consider is that that long history of the formation of non-Indigenous lacrosse organizations like the Canadian Lacrosse Association that exists to this very day, um, they've benefited from the, the dispossession of Indigenous peoples, the, the appropriation of the game. And so we have to reconcile that or non-Indigenous people in the Canadian Lacrosse Association and Ontario Lacrosse Association and BC have to reconcile that. They have to do, um, there has to be restitution, I would think, and accountability and a, a reconciliation towards that, um, which is really important. Okay, so I don't want to be, you know, Mr. Negative all the time, because there's this really other cool aspect of 
um, what this game could be in the era of so-called reconciliation, if you want to call it that. And that's through resurgence movements. So what I, one of the really neat things that I've been able to witness over the last uh, 10 years of doing this book or writing this book is the amazing Indigenous communities across the country that are actually using the game of lacrosse as a way of resurgence. That is to help the Indigenous inside flourish. So um, organizations like the Mi'kmaq um, in Nova Scotia have started up their own lacrosse organizations and they're using their own language, their own culture, their socio-political relations um, and their own creation stories of the game of lacrosse to help Indigenous youth be introduced to all of those things. You see this in the Haywak communities or Plains Cree. Um, they have started up their own lacrosse organizations and are teaching uh, Indigenous youth through the language and the game um, to introduce them back to language and culture and ceremonies. Um, we see this with the Anishinaabe, which is amazing. Um, there's a new lacrosse team being created uh, that I've been witnessing over the last year and helping with. Uh, the Anishinaabe um, and individuals from Anishinaabe communities are creating their own kind of equivalent of the Iroquois Nationals. They're actually creating a team that's going to represent the Anishinaabe uh, on the international stage as a sovereign nation. So in order to do that, you have to have this resurgent movement. You have to have a movement of people that knowledge holders and elders and community and language speakers that know the history of their sovereignty, of their nationhood, of the game of lacrosse to be able to implement this um, effectively. Because in order to have a team that represents your sovereignty, you have to have those experts, those knowledge holders um, play an active role in that to make that happen. So there's this really amazing indigenous resurgence of lacrosse taking place in this area of reconciliation. So I would say that um, supporting those efforts, reaching out and saying whether it's donating money, equipment or time um, is some of the best ways that people can kind of contribute to this process. Look up their websites, look up the Haudenosaunee Nationals, which is the women's team. Look up the Iroquois Nationals, which is the men's team. Look up the Anishinaabe um, team um, that, that's taking place. They're doing some amazing work uh, across the country, across North America and Turtle Island. Thanks very much. And this bridges into uh, Peter Baxter's question. Um, he is asking, I'm just paraphrasing shortly, but he does a uh, quote Oren Lyons in your book saying that lacrosse retains the power to heal and resolve conflict. So further, um, he says it is medicine. It is a medicine game. It is a game to heal. So Peter is asking how best to educate lacrosse athletes. How to how best to educate lacrosse athletes teams, uh, non-Indigenous athletes about the truth and the origins of Creator's Game? Yeah, this is, um, this is always a difficult question for me to answer because it's not where I place my attention. Um, my, my attention to the resurgence of this game is actually devoted towards Indigenous youth. Like, that's who I think need the, that time and energy is focusing on that Indigenous inside. That's not to say that it's not important that non-Indigenous athletes learn about this game, but those are things that non-Indigenous people can do on their own that doesn't require, it doesn't always require Indigenous peoples to do the hard backbreaking labor of reconciliation or their own decolonization efforts. Decolonization can be done by non-Indigenous people with, of course, in partnership with Indigenous people, but it's so important that we don't forget about Indigenous communities, Indigenous youth throughout this process, um, that all our time and energy is not spent on that colonial outside, that we have to also think about the Indigenous inside. That's what I mean by this resurgence. So it is important that non-Indigenous peoples um, are reading and, uh, and thinking and considering about the decolonization of this game. For instance, the use of mace, uh, racist mascots or, uh, and team names and imagery is, and iconography is still widespread throughout the game of lacrosse. 
So it, it'll only take you a two minute search of teams like the team I played for, the KW Braves or the Mississauga Tomahawks or the Burlington Chiefs or what used to be the Brooklyn Redmen. Now have, they've actually changed their name or are in the process of changing that name. Um, this is still going on to this very day. So these are things that people can get involved with and bring an end to is stop the use of racist mascots and use of racist um, team names and that imagery. Um, it all plays on the savagery of indigenous peoples and it all plays on the dehumanization of indigenous peoples, whether it's certain images or certain stories. And so it's important to kind of counter that and recognize that. That's something that the Canadian Lacrosse Association uh, and Ontario Lacrosse Association, they still haven't stepped in yet. Um, they, I know that there are conversations, but uh, about ending that type of thing. Um, recently, a story broke in um, Ontario where the Ontario Lacrosse Association is actually facing a human rights complaint for the treatment of Indigenous athletes, lacrosse athletes in particular. Um, that's something you can Google. It broke this summer, late this summer. Um, but if you look at Ontario Lacrosse Association and human right, Ontario Human Rights, um, there's news stories about that. And that's something that, um, so all to say there's a long way to go. Um, there's a lot of work that can be done that people can support um, and that needs to take place. But at the same time, I just urge people to remember that um, it's, that's not necessarily, that's, that's one, one small piece of a larger kind of um, initiative that should be taking place. And we have to focus, we also have to focus on how are we getting indigenous youth to um, connect with their languages, socio-political relations, their communities through this sport. Or if it's not this sport, then how are you doing it through other ways? How are we growing um, the way in which indigenous peoples identify? How are we making that better? How are we making that go forward to tomorrow? Well, I got to say that that's a powerful message and we might need to leave it at that because our time is coming to an end. There's some fabulous um, comments coming up through the chat box. I wish I got to all the questions, but unfortunately we're out of time, but there's some really um, great messages of thanks and appreciation. And we have a note from Lynn saying that the KW Braves are changing their name. Fantastic. Uh, Brick great. Brooklyn has changed theirs. Um, and then it says Cambridge Minor Lacrosse Next from Leo. So I just wanted to, uh, if you don't get a chance to see the, the chat box, so there's some really great updates, but some wonderful notes of thanks. And I sincerely say, Chimigwech, uh, Alan, for your time and your generosity. Uh, I always feel nourished after speaking with you. I, I miss our, our time that we used to have together in person, but uh, to have this event uh, during the pandemic and COVID that we could all come together and have this conversation, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate uh, the Loria alumni folks for putting this together. Um, and I think um, Brittany is going to close us out. So I'll uh, say thanks and then um, I'll, I'll allow Brittany to say goodbye. Thank you so much again, Alan and Melissa, for your time this evening. We really appreciate it. We will now end the recording.